I'm Darius and I'm Sam and welcome to the Oxford Studio podcast. This podcast is by young people for young people just to talk about the things that we care about. We're here to give you a voice whether that's the voice of your creativity, your professionalism or just something that you're doing that you feel needs to be spoken about. And if you want to get in touch and actually get on this podcast you really can. We don't like I mean, we promise. And we genuinely, we promise. But the real question here is, are you listening? I mean, are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? <laughs> Let's just get on into the podcast. Welcome back to the Black Lives Matter mini series. There are some themes within this mini series that may be upsetting to you. If it is triggering to you, themes of racism, bullying, and various other things, please we implore you to listen to another one of our podcasts that will be much more beneficial to you. Thank you, and I we hope you enjoy the Black Lives Matter mini series. Let's get into it right now. Hi everyone, welcome back. Welcome back to the Oxford Street Youth Podcast. This is the Black Lives Matter mini series. So far, you have heard from Steve Basanti, and now we are going to get to hear from an incredible woman. Not not even not even just you no know, normal, but now incredible next level Hi. woman. Her name is Sasha, and I'm so glad to be sat with her now. Hi, Sasha. How are you? Hi, Darius. I'm okay, thank you. I have to say, you're fantastic and incredible yourself. So <laughs> I have you. to give you that perhaps a shout out. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm so glad we're gonna we're gonna get deep into this conversation. Now, first up, like, who are you? Like, what do you, I mean? I know who you are, but like the listeners, tell them who you are, what you do. Hi, I'm Sasha. I refer to myself as Oxford's Black Panther. I believe myself to be a freedom fighter and an activist. Also, I do a lot of community work, so I'm a youth worker and a local business owner. So, so lately I've been doing the BLM movement. Yeah. So I'm sure most of you have probably seen me doing that. So the real aim is what does BLM mean to me? BLM means real freedom for my children in their future, access to opportunities, funding in their communities, and really an equal playing field in life. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, I just want to talk a little bit more about your business. Like... Like, I, just, I just want to delve into that a bit more because like, I'm intrigued. So I've recently opened a cafe slash restaurant on Cowley Road in Oxford. So we do like, it's like a youth cafe, you call it that. We've employed young black people in the community. We've employed young refugees in the community. We do a food larder every Wednesday from the restaurant. So we have food parcels that we hand out to the homeless and to anybody in need. We also deliver those food parcels. We basically started this as a stem from BLM to say, we don't just want to speak about building our own institutions and our own businesses, but we want to do so. And with yeah. doing so, here comes the Oxa Kitchen. Oh, yes. So, like people, you're going to have to get yourself down there, you know, get, get your belly full, help out the people in the community. Like, you know, we, we have to support this. We genuinely have to support this. And I'm excited to come down because I, I won't get some. Oh, food. do come down. Do come down. <laughs> we have like jerk chicken pizza. So our jerk, our jerk chicken pizza right now is giving me life. So we have jerk chicken, curry goat, oxtail. We also have a uh, kind of an American seafood menu so snow crabs Ooh. lobster we've got a, quite a few choices there in the seafood we do steamed fishes we do vegan and vegetarian pizzas we've got vegan cheese we've really brought a lot of it in together okay that's amazing so basically anyone who's listening or watching you have no excuse there is something for you there like you can't say oh no i'm vegetarian i'm vegan or i don't eat this i don't eat that you are catered for it is fine so get yourself down there okay okay you're listening are, exactly are you listening get yourself down we have there. bars too Ooh. so we have an event coming up as well so we're doing a freedom summer event which is like a reggae brunch Ooh. So we're doing a brunch on the first weekend of August, we'll be doing that. So we're trying out how it is to do events on like a larger scale. So we're nervous about it, but we think anything is possible. 
Awesome. Yes, exactly. Anything is possible. Now, on on the theme of anything being possible, um, at the very start of this podcast, I said a quote from um, a brilliant lady called Elaine Welteroff. And I just want to read it to you. And I just want to see your take on it and your reaction to it. You are not alone. When you exist in spaces that weren't built for you, remember sometimes that just being you is a, is the revolution. How do you feel about hearing something like that? So it sits with me because I've been entering a lot of, a lot of spaces that you wouldn't normally see a black person in. So yeah. hence I've been I've been protesting Parliament Square. I've been up to Bristol, I've been to I've been Oxford, I've been traveling a bit with the movement. So it resonates with me because I believe I'm now a symbol of what some might call not of the revolution. And that's important that I play that role, especially in my community, because I want to help the voiceless have a voice. And that's even speaking for those that have passed as well as those that are living and don't have the confidence to do what I'm out here doing or what you're out here doing. Yeah, definitely. I think it's everything that you're doing. I'm deeply inspired. I'm just there like, what, Sasha? Like, she here, she there, she <laughs> everywhere. I do the talk, everything. <laughs> oh, and someone came into the restaurant. So we was advertising for chefs. And do you know what they said? Do you know Ma Smith? I said, <gasps> yes. <laughs> I said, yes, we do. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> You're well known. Your your family are well known in the community as well. Uh, yeah, it's just like I, I think all of us we're all out here trying to make some kind of impact. Trying to you know, you, it starts with just helping one person, and then yeah, when you start absolutely. to help that one person, it builds and builds and builds. So yeah. Um, so obviously you're extremely passionate about the BLM movement, and uh, as am I, you know, fight the power and everything. Yes, definitely. Um, but I just want to know, like, when you first heard about um, the brutal murders of George Floyd, Amord Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and the countless others, because there have been so many others, how George did you and those around you, exactly so many, how did you feel? Like, how did you react to that? I felt like enough was enough. I looked at my sons and I said enough was enough. And the story is so crazy. And I, I always get nervous when telling people how I how I became able to speak hmm. so I woke up one morning 5 a.m in the morning that's like the two days after I'd watched the George Floyd massacre basically the it's assassination I can yeah. call that so two days after I'd watched that I woke up at 5 a.m in the morning I was crying and I was sweating and I called Imade which is someone I work on the just uh, one justice movement which was a movement yeah. challenge in the hostile environment so I rang him and I said I feel like I have to accept this I feel like a challenge has been set to me and it's like, I have to do it. I said, I've never felt the urge to speak out this mm. much and to be so transparent about it. In my emotions, it was raw emotions that were coming out and I was crying and I just basically, I did a live basically saying enough was enough. And from there, I went around galvanizing and immobilizing people to basically say, do you feel enough is enough? And explain to them what the movement meant to me. It meant the security of my children. It meant that my children could have access to opportunities that they wouldn't normally have access to. And it wasn't because they weren't capable. It was simply because of their color. And it was a reflection moment to say, am I going to wait for my son to reach at a point where I'm saying a eulogy before I'm reading out his graduation certificate? Mm. Do I want that? Or do I want a prison system to pick him up? And then he spends his life in and out of a rev revolving door. And you think about what we're losing and missing out on in the black community. And for me, that motivated me enough to say, right, resistance is a must and enough is enough. And in that way, I thought, let's ask a peace. Yeah. So they realize we're fed up. We don't want to fight anyone. We don't want to argue with anyone. We simply want to be heard, people to take accountability and to start working together towards that change. So we're not asking our white counterparts to work on their own to achieve that change. We also know in our own communities we sub-oppress and we need to learn how to love each other in our own communities and able to challenge or tackle outside problems outside of our community. We also have to be empathetic towards each other. We also have to show positive regards. Exactly. Um, I mean, when I came to the Black Lives Matter protest in South Park, 
the way that it made me feel I mean I've I've never been a part of something like that. It's you were amazing. Time. So yeah, it's like the first time. You were time. amazing. Oh, thank you so much. And it's like that experience of being like in literally in solidarity with so many people of, you know, different ages, races, everything. It was absolutely amazing because it's like, as you said, it's not just about, you know, white people doing their part or black people doing their part. It's about us all coming together all and doing our part. Yeah, definitely. I, I think with the events as well, it opened my eyes a lot more to the Black sub oppression because mm. I didn't just have it from own experience. I heard other young Black people speaking about that, that oppression and having to hide their identities and having to... There's this normalised or self regulating thing that happens in a Black community. Like you feel like there's a particular way to be a Black man or a particular way yeah. to be a Black And I realised that we're all actually unique and that u- uniqueness is what makes us special. It's what adds to our journey. It's what makes our journey what it is. And it took a pandemic, sadly, to become a blessing and a curse in disguise. It's like a blessing in disguise and a curse. But we actually got to know people on a human level rather than just a level of capitalists, like the clothes, the hair. Like You actually got to know the hearts of people and that touched me and humbled me more than anything else. Yeah, definitely. It was absolutely amazing. Speaking of a journey or your journey specifically um what experiences in the uk have you felt of racism whether that's you know in the workplace in school anything that you feel comfortable sharing obviously like what have those experiences been like so i went to ruskin college to do youth and community development in our in our class we had a dispute where a young lady a white female was racist to a black male I was then approached by an adult and was asked to facilitate the reintegration of this young lady because I'm a strong black woman and because people listen when I speak. I'm very specific about what my voice is used for. And this person that asked me was actually a professional working at a college. And they said, oh, I will teach this young girl about what it is to be what to ha- have white guilt. And the black man should go to the black teacher to learn about oppression of black men and I said no I feel that all of the tutors should be approachable we shouldn't Mm. just segregate it to you go to that one and you go I believe that they could each benefit from speaking to both of you and having a perspective and why as a white female she might have made that mistake and why is it so hurtful for him as a black man to have that comment made towards him so for me I didn't want to get involved and then when I didn't get involved soon enough it became oh your mental health we're worried about your mental health and I saw that as a big oh okay but my mental health is hasn't been an issue I work as a youth worker I work with young people Mm -hmm. so surely if you thought my mental health was an issue I shouldn't have been working so from that point I learned how to challenge these kinds of behaviors and then it didn't just happen there I even experienced it to today the hate mails are just racking in and people will often now come into the shop to say oh who's the owner and I'm like, me, do you own it on your own? Is there a partner? Are you just the manager? So now I'm the owner. Do you have a shareholder? No, I'm the owner. <laughs> it's like, how many times? It's like they, and I experience it in like wholesales and stuff. When I go to buy stuff for my business, people yeah. just assume that I haven't got the ability to either pay cash or they have to double check my stuff just in case I'm trying to steal. And it's like, well, my DBS is quite clean and yeah. I've never had a criminal record. I've never been arrested in that sense. So it also puts your back up because you start to be self regulant So in certain spaces, you'll behave a particular way. And I've experienced that a lot. And when I was growing up, I grew up in care partially in my life. And I realized that the white families I was being placed with, they didn't understand me. Mm. They didn't understand me because I had a different diet. I, my hair was a bit thicker and it needed a lot more processing and it was more than a wash and blow dry and go. It was, it yeah. needed oil and it needed con- so it was a lot for them to get used to. So I realized there it was like isolating. So I challenged that also. So in my life, I've always been able to challenge stuff happening to me, but I've just never done it on a larger scale. But I think my final straw was when a woman petted my son's hair without permission or nothing she just went over to my son rubbed her fingers for his hair and said oh can I and just touched it she didn't mm. even wait to finish her sentence and I realized that she didn't see him as a person but rather like she was fascinated 
it was like an infatuation with, I need to feel the texture of your hair, even if it's against your permission. It's a need for me to feel mm. this. And it's like, I felt like my son's personal space was breached. And I thought, how many other young black boys or black girls are experiencing this kind of overt racism? And basically treating them as if they don't need their permission to breach those spaces. And it's also disconnected emotion from black kids because she didn't realize what my son, my son is a very shy person and he's experienced bullying in his life. So yeah. for him, he wasn't going to stand up and say, don't touch my hair. And with my son, I realized a lot of people wanted him to behave a certain way. He likes to dance ballet. He's quite a flamboyant boy. Yeah. So a lot of people that come around, especially in the Caribbean community, used to say, don't stand with your hand on your shoulder, like kimbered on your side. Or the, he used to do a thing with his hand where when he talks, he kind of used hand gestures yeah. a lot. And people used to say to me, I, need, I needed to break him out of it. And I firmly said, no, I will accept yeah. him however he is, however he chooses to be, that's my child and I love him regardless. And that also made me realize that they were trying to call my son gay in a way that they wanted me to isolate him. They wanted me to challenge his character. And instead mm. that made me make his character grow into whatever it wanted to be even more and give him the confidence to say like, like when I'm around friends and my dad, I encourage him because I don't want to silence his personality. I don't want him to become a person that exhibits violence because he's, yeah. unless you're violent, you're not a man. It's like, no, you're a man. Crying makes you a man because you connect with your emotions. Everything you do makes you a man because they could clearly see that you are a man. So <laughs> don't just, don't change who you are. And when anyone says anything to you, I tell my son, tell me, because I would challenge it there and then in front of my son. So he realizes I'm not one of those sub-oppressors. I won't allow people to oppress, you know, I won't jump on it out of fear of my culture. People saying, oh, her son is this or her son is, I don't care about those because they're not in my immediate family. You're who I've grown. You're who I have to answer to. I don't have to answer to any of those people if I don't want to. Mm -hmm. And I don't want my son's life to be fractured out of fear of isolation from a culture that should accept him as human anyway yeah i mean i i wholeheartedly agree with that i've had um experiences with my hair being touched i've had experiences with people like questioning if i'm black people questioning if i'm straight i am by the way but people question it all it's the not time their business people... exactly I, like... I always say to people if you are someone that wonders what someone does in their bedroom, you're actually the one that's weird. Because why has your mind gone so far into that person's bedroom? That yeah. is weird. It's like that really person weird. is not the one that's affected. You are the one that's affected because you've taken someone's personal life and made it your business enough to dislike them or to treat them in a way that's dehumanizing. And that is what I have a problem with. I have an uncle living in America who's a trans male. So for me it's important that I also show my uncle that there is acceptance in the world. Love is blind. Growing up as a child and I was around you, I didn't, I wasn't around you in a sexual way. So I clearly, I don't have any clue about your sex, sexual life, but I yeah. know the love you showed me and I know the kind of person you are. Like my uncle literally could not hurt a fly. So when I see people like get angry when we went to Jamaica and people were angry at him and like shouting at him, I found that more upsetting mm. than anything else because I, I know his personality. I know he's not going to shout back. He's not, he's too scared to have a fight with them. So instead of going back on holiday to his own country, he stayed away. I yeah. don't want my son to then feel that way. And I think silence is violence. So if I'm ever in a place and I see something going on, I almost feel like as a community worker and as an activist, it is my place. It's just like when you're first day training, you see some, someone in a medical emergency, you feel like yeah. you are at will to go over and see. I feel like it is my place to be that voice when that person is voiceless. I have to be like, no, you have to stop that. It's not right. And through doing that, I've realized a lot of people are more able to now say, gosh, I could stand up for myself now. Yeah. I just never feel comfortable before doing it because you don't have the support of other people, especially in the black community. Things go so unspoken. No one in my family wants to speak about my uncle. It's like they, they speak as if he's gone hmm. and I know he's still very much living. So 
that disturbs me and that re that shows me that there's PTSD in the black community that we've not dealt with whether that has to do with the slavery way of demasculating black men that we're now transferring onto the LGBTQ community that we shouldn't we should also realize that they go through everyday oppression probably more than just race remember yeah. they go through sexual oppression they go they go through mental oppression more than just the average black person to be black and a member of that you are braver than I am because you go through probably twice as much as I would ever go through on a daily basis exactly yeah and I think that's that's a conversation that unfortunately isn't really happening it's actually terrifying the amount of um, trans people who are being killed on a date black trans people who are killed. Being killed on a daily basis it's terrifying like I've just been like looking at like stats they I think don't there was the age, one week the age recently. expectation yeah it's terrible they don't live yeah. up into late 30s they're dying in early 30s early 20s it's actually worse than any other like suicide alcohol abuse i just don't think that's right because it's like as much as you know there are people out there who are like yeah all lives matter but then if you look at if you look at things like that it's like well clearly they don't because if this demographic of people are still you know dying or being killed or like committing suicide because of how they feel or how they've been oppressed to feel it's like that's mad that's messed up that's not right and we shouldn't be doing that to people like just love people for who they are like just respect people for who they are and that that's exactly. where i guess we need to get to we're not there yet i hope hope we're like we're working towards that but we're really always, not there yet i always say to people look at maslow's hierarchy of needs people need to have a sense of belonging a sense of safety and they can become self-actualized but until those very basic necessities like safety a place of belonging, love, of establish, then you can't really expect a person to move forward. Yeah. And in the black, the BLM movement, you have like heterosexual male who feel like marching with the LGBTQ trans community kind of demasculates them. Actually, you demasculate yourself because back in our ancestor days, it was, it was powerful to be able to challenge the masculine and the feminine energy. You were considered a leader. Hmm. but this world has changed it so much that instead our backs are up against people that it don't need to be because that just means that they're able to challenge both energies they could be empathetic to both masculine and feminine energies and to me that's more powerful than holding power just in one community yeah definitely now we're gonna we're gonna gonna change gears slightly um so what are some questions that i guess you've either been asked or approached by um, white and non-black people of color like which questions that they've asked would you wish that they would just stop asking that are like annoying okay, and so really sometimes something you skin. wouldn't know something you wouldn't know yet is <laughs> i've recently had an interview with tommy robinson Ooh, oh okay. so i believe in going to all angles and getting the information because i'm not just like i don't want someone to read a book and say a black man is a savage i want to do the groundwork and he, he, in this meeting, he said that he was bringing us to make peace, black and white unity. Yeah. In fact, he didn't. He brought another black male, Luke Reed, to this interview, who then said he didn't believe that systemic racism existed. They then asked me a bunch of questions about BLM as an organization connected to George Soros and the democratic movement and Marxism and stuff like that. And I was quite honest with him. I don't answer things that I'm not completely i don't have the information for and i refuse to comment on it but what i will say is i don't follow blm an organization i follow blm the movement yeah the movement is all people all oppression and challenging all sides of oppression the one question that stands out to me is when people say what does palestine have to do with the blm movement everything silence is violence oppression is oppression and I believe in speaking out against all oppressions, not just the oppression of my own people, but anywhere I see oppression, I believe that it is, it is a human place to draw light to that, to say I recognise just as how I want others to recognise and sympathise with the black oppression. I've also got to be a bridge for others in their oppression to say, actually, I see you. And a lot of it comes from fear of anti-Semitism. And mm. I realise that that also in itself is a way to keep silent and silence is violence again so yeah. i ask people don't ask me why you should ask yourself why do you think it's not important to mention palestine 
thank you brilliant answer appreciate that um yeah i think there's so many layers to when you talk about black lives matter or when you talk about oppression generally there's so many layers to it because there's not just i mean to sound really corny it's not just black and white there's so much like more it goes deeper so than the skin different... exactly and i feel like sometimes people don't realize that people are just kind of looking and say oh okay you're black okay cool so this movement's just for you and it's like well no um, I said it in a video recently that, you know, Black Lives Matter is not an anti-white movement. And I've had so many people ask me, like, oh, is it an anti-white movement? I'm like, no, it, it's, it's not. It's just not. It's never in the same... in the vision. Exactly. And in the same way that feminism is not an anti-male um, movement, it's simply just saying equality. We need to stop all of this oppression. We all want to be... But when like, the suffragettes um, started... When the suffragists started, they did have a male, they did have male help. They had a male commission helping them to get yeah. their movement off. They were supported by some very prominent activists, male activists, that helped their voices to be heard. So it wasn't just a, a movement for women. It was a, a movement that meant men that wanted to show women that equal respect was a part of. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like those are important messages that need to be, I guess, reiterated because some people don't know that. Some people like just d don't know like why it's important to have allies, even if you are not that race, that gender, you're not that sexual orientation. To have allies is super, super important because you know you it's have like people that you can like, speak to. Fred Hampton said, "We won't fight racism or racism, but we should fight racism with solidarity." Yeah. And I firmly believe in that, that solidarity is the way to fight the system and what it's doing. I think some people do get scared when they hear things like defund the police. When mm. it's like, what do you mean defund the police? We don't want to live in complete chaos. It's like, but for you, it's not complete chaos. For us as black people, we're telling you we're already living in complete chaos. We're not saying that we want to defund the police and turn every community into a criminal site. What we're yeah. saying is we want to better train the police, equip the police to work within communities and to build meaningful relationship and relationship that consists of trust within those communities and able to help the young people and the community itself into developing a safe space. If, however, if you're walking outside your house and your neighborhood office is very friendly and you rarely see crime happen in your area, and when you do it, it is the police that comes to help you, you do have a different image of the police. You don't necessarily yeah. have the perspective of what the police interaction is. So I think things like that scare them. Things like iconography is being taken down. It, it creates a higher stance in white guilt. And I, I can't stress enough how much we're saying we don't want you just to feel white guilt. A guilt is a part of it, yes, but we don't want your guilt. We don't want you to be depressed from your guilt. We don't want your, your guilt to oppress you. We want you to utilize that privilege, acknowledge that that privilege does exist because it's, it's genuine freedom. That's what we're saying. When we say privilege, we're not saying that, oh, you're rich and I'm not, and you've got it and I have. Mm. We acknowledge that there's a working class, there's yeah. the, the bourgeois, and there's a proletariat. We, we acknowledge that. What we're saying is there's a certain kind of freedom, and I don't know if freedom is the right word to use now instead of privilege. There's a certain mm. kind of freedom that you have that I don't have. And when you speak about the Black Pound Day, their back goes up. And I'm saying, actually, do you realize that most Black people that are employed in large corporations as a tokenistic offer, it's you're either yeah. the diversity officer, the urban officer, the, the one that's the BAME officer. It's, it's a position specifically for your color. It's not based on a talent that you've come with. And yeah. also, they don't necessarily have to employ a lot of uh, equal number in, in black employees, but they give the one just so they take a box, a corporate box that says, oh, we have diversity in our company. Yeah. We represent multiculturalism. And it's terms like that as well that we're challenging. It's not to say, oh, we want to tear away your history. The, the statues and the iconographies are a part of it as a symbol, yeah. but it's not the whole image of the movement. There's more to it. There's mental health. There's health in general. There's housing. There's austerity that we're challenging. That's even austerity exists in all our communities, but just imagine how affected the BAME community must be because we're affected anyway, but we're extra affected now that we're in a pandemic and stuff like that. 
and we've had several inquiries that say that. So it's very clear that it's either the public has not got access to the information that we are feeling that we have access to and it's making us upset. So it's coming together to educate each other on things that you might have not necessarily known. Like for some of my white friends, since this has happened, they've said to me, Sasha, we need to sit down. We've never, we've talked about hair. We talked about food. We've talked about drinks. We've thought, we've never talked about race. Yeah. And I said, it's because you've probably never seen me as a colour. You've seen me as a person. And they say, but I've now noticed that I have small ways about me that might have come across as racist, but I never realised it yeah. until uh, following the movement and listening to the stuff that not just you, but other young people and other black people have said, I've realised I've acted in ways that could have been seen as offensive. And I never apologised for it. And I never checked myself on it. But let's have the talk. And that warmed my heart more than anything else because that's what real allyship is. Yeah. It's willing to start. It's a willingness to learn. It's an open mindedness to understand that you're not saying I'm wrong and I'm written off. You're saying, let's work at this together. Exactly. I help you, you help me. Yeah, I think that's amazing. And like, I'm super excited because further along in this series, we are going to be speaking to some allies. We're going to be like having those conversations because I think it's important, as you said, it's important to, you know, have both sides, not just, you know, speaking to, you know, young black people who are going through it, but I want to, we really want to speak it's to allies. It's definitely worth like that's it. Important. Yeah. So it's going to be a more rounded conversation. Well what does this movement mean to you? What does the BLM movement represent to you? I recently also met with Owen Jones and we spoke about dropping the gown and joining the town and what us as the town members living here in Oxford felt towards this movement and what it meant for us. And that's actually one of the first times someone took the chance and the opportunity to ask, what does the movement represent to you? Yeah. What does BLM mean? And that makes you have to think and reflect. And it will be good to know what our allies find that this movement means to them. What is it that they feel that they're following? What is the outcome that they would also want to see? Yeah. Because we have to remember what I could, what I've got talent in, someone else might be lacking in. What I'm lacking in, someone else might have talent in. And sometimes it's not always searching for a new way, but utilizing the already existing methods and the already existing ways of doing things to suit the agenda that we're we're going after it's also yeah. coming together to create one human voice and cutting away the division of black and white but coming as the human race to see how best we could live in one coexist in one world one community together and be happy in it and be mentally happy in that space exactly i really really appreciate that and to to, to round up something that you mentioned in the beginning but i just want to you know just I guess speak more about it but you said at the beginning of this that like black lives matter means to you you know the safety and protection of your children but does it mean anything else to you because I feel like to different people as you said like it means different things it could mean you know personally for me black lives matter means legacy so eventually when I do have children or grandchildren hopefully they'll be living in a time where you know if something drastic and horrible just like police brutality happens again that justice will be taken quicker that accountability will be taken quicker and we wouldn't have Definitely. to wait so long to get to that point so what does it mean to you so very much what you're saying like we've had the launch for the inquiring commission team over a month ago and yet still they've not listed or named the person who will be leading that commission but when our government had a problem with a phone company, that yeah. team was formed so quick. That decision was made in a snap and that was a capitalist decision. So it's about equipping my children enough to be intellectual enough to understand their oppression and not only intellectual enough to understand it, but to challenge it. Yeah. To challenge it, not just for themselves, but for the future generations that will pass them. It is a legacy. And a part of that legacy that I want to leave is I'm not going to die and not see it happen. I want to live and see it happen. And I want to be able to share at least the beginning of those moments of freedom with my grandchildren and my children. And yeah. at least said, we did it, we did it together. And for them to have the, the courage to continue even without me and it's feeding my community. So I don't just do food bank for the Caribbean community. I do it for everybody. Yeah. Anybody who needs it, I will deliver. And I think it's creating that human, that touch of humanness that we forgot humanity. For me, it's bringing back humanity around and I firmly do believe that 
this is our one opportunity to challenge this hostile environment that we, we're living in. And if we let it go, then all we can write the next generation is an apology letter. Mm-hmm. Yet again, and I'm not willing to see that. So BLM is very much a way of life for me right now. Yeah, definitely. I 100% agree to you, agree with you. And yeah, I don't want to be writing that letter either saying like, sorry for not doing enough. Like we are here in this position. Again, I said on the last podcast, but I'm going to say it again. I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity and the platform to be able to bring these stories to the Oxford Youth Podcast, because it's extremely important for not only like our personal development, but for everyone to learn to grow and get better. And I feel like, yeah, these conversations aren't going to stop. Um, they, they will not stop categorically. And if you're annoyed at them, sorry, like, <laughs> not sorry, because they need to sorry. keep going. We're going to be heard. <laughs> so we're doing a thing at the cafe called Revolution Thursdays, yeah. where we have like, open mic where people could read poetry, do music live, and it's just keeping the community in tune and creating that safe space that we can still speak about this stuff it's not always about a march sometimes it take yeah. it's taking time to listen to each other networking with each other so people can have a chance of interacting and bringing down certain barriers that weren't down before and really getting to know each other within the community hmm. so that we could care about each other when we hear these things are happening yeah i think that's brilliant so guys make sure you head on down Cowley Road, the Oxford Kitchen, like go, take take up your foot in your hand and run, <laughs> as, as my grandmother did say. <laughs> and if you don't understand that, basically just just go down there, just just go. <laughs> um, but yes. <laughs> Um, But Sasha, thank you so, so much for coming on and chatting to me. This is such an important conversation. Um, I will make sure, as I said in the previous podcast, that any links to anything to do with, you know, black mental health, you know, if you're going through other, other things on top of, you know, the pandemic the blm movement seeing all of this black trauma they will be down um, in the description below so you can check them out you can get the help that you need because we don't want you to be suffering in silence and obviously there'll be links to everyone that will be in this podcast so you can find out more about them as well so make sure you go and check them out sasha Uh, thank you so much you're marvelous continue the work you're doing it's amazing stuff it needs to be done and power to you my king Thank you. Power to you, my queen.